Hey uh, folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to another episode of our little mini tutorial for Unity where we're creating an alert system similar to what uh, we know from things like Civ 5 and Civ 6 and probably lots of other games, but those are the ones, of course, I am the most familiar with. In episode 1, we built a little test team, got an excuse to, to practice a little bit of Blender work, and that was about it. In episode 2, we worked with the user interface over here to develop our little alert placeholders, which, I mean, we just have a bunch of dummy ones in here for now just to see how it is. We got a bit of a grid setup, which is good, but no code and nothing is actually doing anything. That's what we're doing in this episode over here. The first thing I want to do is I want to start by wiring up that close button over here. Now, in the past, one of the tricks I have used for the close button is something you can do that literally quite requires no code whatsoever because, all right, on our close button, we added a button component over here, uh, which is a script that does a lot of things for you, like tinting your object. We can even like do something like um, uh, we could add in a tint on highlight, which is the same as hovering, I believe. So if I hit play, and now I hover over this button, it'll turn red, and we press it, it goes to the press color. There you go. I mean, you know, uh, oh, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't unhighlight? Really? Oh, it does. Probably. Oh. The press. I guess because, I mean, something should happen when you press it or something, maybe. Nah, that seems a little odd. I'm surprised the highlight doesn't go away. To me, that kind of seems like a Unity bug. Well, let's not worry about it. What we're going to do is avoid that by not using a highlight color. Um, or, you know, just by making the close button do something. So I was going to say, in the past, one of the things I've done um, for things like dialog boxes, right, is something like, um, so this button script has a, uh, a list over here where you can add functions that get called when the button gets clicked. So we can add in um, a line. It needs to know which game object to is going to be responsible, which game object is going to receive this click message. So that is going to be this alert over here. I'm going to put it in there. And one thing you can do, then when you choose the function, is you can say, I'm going to signal the game object component. You have to choose a component. I'm going to say game object. We could set active, and it's a Boolean, which means you can turn it on or off. Okay? And you can point to anything at, at all. But by doing this, if I hit play, when I click this button, this game object is set to inactive. It gets grayed out. This is not actually a solution. If I go though, if I say, if I apply this to the prefab, what game object would this be? Oh, it's smart enough to just like be relative to itself. Excellent, okay. So now all of the close buttons will seemingly close the pop-ups, but it doesn't close them. It just makes those game objects inactive. And it's particularly obvious if say, I close this one. Oh, now that's interesting. I didn't realize the grid would automatically collapse around inactive objects. So, I mean, it looks good. But meanwhile, we have we still have all these alerts. They still already exist. Okay, they continue to exist. Now, this sort of mechanic works really nicely for something like a dialog box where you always have, or a certain window, right? You have some sort of window that can be opened or closed. Well, you might want the window to always exist. And then you're just talking about toggling whether it's active or not, right? It's on it's off and that's all you're doing when you hit the button on the screen let's say it's an options menu you hit the options menu all it does is enable the uh, the game object and then when you hit the close button in your option window all it does is disable that game object very very fine but here this is not good enough because we don't want to keep all alerts that ever happen in, in existence I mean in a long-term game you get hundreds or thousands of alerts and they would all clutter up your game yeah they'd be inactive but it's still not good so that's not what you're looking for what we want to do is when we click that um, that close button, we actually want to destroy this game object. The problem is there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no way to just call, like, destroy on the game object this way. Um, so we are going to have to write a script, but that's okay, because I think that this alert needed a script at some point anyway. So we're going to create a new component. So I'm going to, I guess we'll keep things neat over here. I will create a folder um, called scripts. And I'm going to create... Now, as I said before, I tend to like all of my stuff that is UI to start with the words UI. And I'd say this alert qualifies as that. So I'm going to go and create a C-sharp script called UI alert. I think that's okay. Uh, we're going to wait a tick for it to just compile. And then, oops, we're going to drag it onto our alert component over here. There we go. So it's got that. I will apply it. So it applies the change to the prefab. So now they all have this alert component. Then we're going to double click on the script and get ready to modify it. And what we want to do first is we're just going to have a single function. Its job is to close slash destroy 
the alert over here. So I think that this alert probably doesn't need a start or an update unless there was going to be some sort of animation. I was just going to get rid of it for now. Um, and I'm going to make a public void close. There you go. That's all it is. And all its job is, is to destroy, destroy this game object. That's it. Just responsible for closing this alert, getting rid of it completely by destroying itself. There may be other things that it will do in here. There could be other, you know, cleanup or something like that that will have to happen at some point. But I, for now, there's nothing else to do other than just destroy itself. So again, it'll compile. And then our close button here, our on click, it will still signal the alert object. But instead of signaling game object.setActive, it's instead going to signal, there's our UI alert script, and it's going to call close over here. So again, what I'll do is I'll apply this to the prefab, I'll hit play, and then if we look at our list over here, instead of getting things disabling, they will simply vanish like that until we have no more alerts whatsoever. There we go. So that's much, much, much better. But of course, that's this is kind of the easy part. The more interesting and more complicated part is how do we create the alerts? So let's say... Let's say we're going to have, um, I, I'm, I'm going to make a dummy button to start off with. Let's tell you what, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get rid of this. The alert list is going to start off empty, which is correct. We're going to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a UI button. This a UI button is just a game object with an image. Um, it has a text inside of it and it has a button component added in there. It's not anything fancy. I'm going to just shove this thing in the top right corner over here. And this is just going to be called... Um, uh, test, uh, test alert. There we go. This button's job is simply to make a fake, like just dummy alert right away. Um, and I guess what we'll do is we'll create a script for this as well. Uh, we'll call this UI um, test alert. That's all. So um, it's a script. Now this script is on the button object. Uh, and again, there's more than one way that you can handle the on-click response. In this UI test alert script, doo -doo -doo, if we added, um, interesting that it turned all red for a second there. I was going to say, there we go. If we had a reference to Unity dot, Unity engine dot event systems. I think we can have this implement like I clickable or something like that, um, which is a very, very powerful way for you to handle clicks. And then we wouldn't have to wire anything in the inspector. It would automatically get notification of certain events. Um, it's very powerful, but a little bit more involved. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is same thing over here. Um, I will do a void. I guess we should just call it on click, which is fine. Um, so on click, it's going to do something. And over here, we are going to make sure that our button, when our button script gets clicked, all it's going to do is it's going to notify, well, it's going to notify itself, and it's going to run the US, UI, UI test alert. Um, oops, we need to make that public. Otherwise, it will not show up. Wait for the compile. UI test alert on click. There we go. So that's it. Again, there, there's other ways we could have wired this in, but this is perfectly fine. So it will let itself know when the button script detects that there's a click, it will let the UI test alert script that this has happened. And that's all. In fact, it doesn't even need to do it that way, but that's going to be okay. So what we're going to do here is somehow let the game know that a new alert has occurred. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've got to think about what it means to set up an alert. Really what we want is some sort of function. We want something called like, I don't know, alerts dot new alert. And we want to pass it something like, this is a test. Um, something like um, icon alert test. And um, the third thing was going to be a game object, which is going to be null. The idea being what you pass when you create an alert, you tell it what the text message will be. Uh, you pass it optionally uh, an icon to use in, in that little pop-up. And then the third optional thing is, is going to be a game object. The idea being, if you just click the alert panel, the camera should move to focus on whatever this game object is, but it's optional. You can just pass it a null or potentially even leave it blank. Um, 
it, it, depending on how we set things up. So that's the sort of system I think I would like is just this very easy, a one-liner. And to me, this one-liner implies something. It implies that we're gonna have some sort of like global slash static. There's gonna be some sort of static function over here. Um, and maybe it's actually, instead of alerts, maybe something like alert list. Ah. So we have an object called alert list. And there's so there's two parts to it. There's the code part of we need to signal the game system as a whole that we've created a new alert. And the second part is we need to create the UI element. I think that we can sort of combine the two perfectly fine. So let's say that we have a script called alert list. Now I'm not prepending it with UI because it's not a pure UI component, although it's gonna do a fair amount of UI -y thingy, so I don't know. And we're gonna attach this to alert list. In practice, it actually doesn't matter what object this alert list is, is hooked up in. And in fact, you could split the job into two sort of subcomponents. Uh, one could be a pure C sharp script that's not a mono behavior object at all. It might be a pure static class, in fact. Um, and then the other half would be the UI script or something like that. But I think we can combine them both here. Um, and it sort of makes sense that it might as well be attached here. It is worth noting that if something is a pure static object, there's pure static script. It doesn't actually have to be attached to anything ever. It never has to be instantiated in any way whatsoever, but this is gonna be okay. This is, you know, Unity-ish, but still good. So we have this script called alert list that has been attached to our to our physical alert list object in the game. It doesn't have to be, but for our, certain, for our uses, it will be. Um, and we know that what we really want is we want a public static function called new alert. That's really what we want. So there's two ways to do um, your design. There's the idea sort of top down and 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 bottom up kind of design, um, um, I don't know, paradigms, I guess? Which is to say, so top down would represent something like this. Here we're describing a function we would like to exist. We're sort of starting from the top and then going to the bottom, which is to say, implementing that function. The other way around is to start from the bottom and saying, well, we, we know we need this sort of function to exist. At some point, someone will call it, so we will provide it. And in practice, in game development and most development, you kind of go both at the same time. Sometimes you start from the bottom up, sometimes you start from the top down, somehow you sort of meet in the middle. These things will, will occur because you'll sort of realize that this is a thing that needs to happen. But now at this point, I can actually even uncomment this. I mean, it's still complaining because this function doesn't technically exist yet, but we're about to implement it. We've got public static new alert, which is going to take in a string, which is going to be alert text. Uh, we're going to have another string, which is going to be the alert icon. Um, I mean, we could pass, I mean, really the alert icon ultimately is going to have to be an image or a texture or something like that. But what I want to do is I want to avoid having these scripts over here know that, right? In fact, we could even take it a step further. And instead of having the text over here, it could be something, you could have um, localization data. This could be something like, um, um, I don't know, UI underscore alert underscore test. It's not a bad thing to consider if this is something like uh, alert, the text, I know, ID, I guess you could call it. Alert icon ID, that makes a lot more sense. And then we can take it in the game object, which is the, um, uh, I don't know, just call it the game object or, or focus object, focus game object. And we could have some of these things just default. I think I need to in shrink in my font just one tick here so we can fit it all in, right? There's no reason that we couldn't do something like have this default to a blank have this thing default to null. That way, um, there you could just call new alert. I'm surprised this is not compiling. Oh, uh, void, you don't return anything. There we go. So now it's no longer red. Yeah, but it gives us the option of saying something like instead alert list dot new alert UI alert test like that. Right? And that becomes perfectly legal. If we're happy with whatever the default icon is and it doesn't have to focus on anything, we could leave this blank. So we can actually call these like this. The one gotcha is that there's no way for you to not specify an icon, but also specify a game object there. The only way to do it in that variance would be to provide an alternate version of new alert, which goes string um, alert text ID. And then here takes a game object like that, you could do that. And then you could have this one just call the other new alert, 
with like this and then focus game object. Like you can provide alternate calls like this. So then there becomes multiple ways of calling this thing. Um, in fact, some people are really not a fan of providing these defaults at all and instead would rather provide another variant of this that just goes like this with a single parameter. And then again, within that, calls this explicitly. So we could do this, for example, and not provide any default values whatsoever. These, these are options, but for the sake, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, maybe I'll leave this in here. That's going to be okay. Um, so that we've got, we've got a few flexibilities. Okay. So, um, so yeah, this variant here, let's get rid of this. So those are illegal calls, which I guess maybe I'll, I'll uncomment them to show that these are still other ways that you could legally call the same thing. Um, and um, so this would be like if we had some sort of localization. So the idea is that somewhere you had some database of like different languages. So there's the UR, UI alert test text that is English, another one for Spanish, another one for French, etc., 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 like that. This is beyond the scope of this particular tutorial, but there's no reason you can't have that. Imagine, so let's say we had a dictionary dictionary of string to string. Um, and actually, we need to have another level of indirection here. This would be example localization, localization um, dictionary, like do not use this as is. An example only this is really not how you want to do things. What this would be a good example of you'd want some other sort of static database to handle it. Which I mean, I guess I I'm getting a little bit out of scope here, but you know what? What the hell? What the hell? Let's create a new script. Do 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 in here, create C sharp script. Um uh, oops. Localization. Like that. And I did accidentally open it at some point. In fact, that's going to be all foobard now because of the way that I implemented that. That's okay. Yeah. Localization. It's not going to be a mono behavior. It's going to be a pure C sharp class. And in fact, more than that, I'm actually going to have it be a static class. The nice thing about this is it can't be instantiated, but it also never needs to be instantiated. We can put in a uh, constructor. Now, in a static case, does, it, does the constructor have to be like public? I guess not, because it should just happen by itself. So this constructor automatically runs at program start, because it's a static class with a static construct. Well, you don't even need this. If you have a static constructor, it will run automatically when your program starts. The cl static class means it can't be instantiated. You can never create a new localization object. And inside of this, we would have that sort of dictionary. Did I, yeah, I close that out. So we're gonna have a dictionary string, which contains another dictionary. String, string, boom, boom. Um, this is gonna be our localization database. Obviously, there are other ways to implement that, but that's going to be okay. Um, so do I have to keep specifying static? Is that going to give me? Yeah, I was gonna say, can't declare instance members. So I have to explicitly put static in front of everything in here, but that's okay. So this localization database belongs to this static class. Uh, but we're gonna have to make sure that we do something like equals new dictionary like that. So now the, the base dictionary isn't empty. And then we could do something like, um, uh, we're going to call load languages, which is going to be some sort of function here. Again, it's going to be another static function called load languages. Um, this would probably read a directory, directory of language files. Um, you know, so you'd have a loop. In our case, we're just going to like dummy create. Um, our database. So localization database, we're going to add a new entry where the string key is en for English, and it's going to have a new dictionary of values within that. Um, and then something like um, static void load, oops, derp, 
Here we're doing load language singular, en. And then we have the static language, which is a string lang like that. Probably uh, read a file XML, JSON, other, um, with all the strings from a language. I'm noticing we're getting a complaint over here. Ooh, boom. There you go. So what we would do here is we would say something like localization database um, lang, so the English entry, and we're just going to create you know a dummy entry at this point. So we can use dot add or we could just use the square brackets either way. And let's assume we're going to load our language with this UI alert test. And this is going to be, this is a test alert. So now we have this database. And then the other thing we're going to need to do is have some sort of public static string. Um, I don't know, get string. So string is, um, uh, what are we calling that? Text ID, I guess, would be the thing to do it. So this is going to be the text ID. And I guess we're gonna need like some sort of static string current language, which can default to English, but we'll probably want something like public static void set language string lang ID, which sets the um, current language to lang ID. You know, we might want to do some extra confirmation that it's one of the ones that we actually have loaded somewhere. But there we go. So then with get string, we are going to simply return localization database with the current language and the text ID. And to do error check all the things. Because right now, if this were trying to read something that didn't exist in the database, it would throw an exception. I mean, we'll get a lovely error in our, in our debug log, but we might want to handle it with a little bit more sophistication. Okay, all that to say, um, alert text is equal to uh, localization Do I need to encourage a compile? There might have still been an error. That's the old one. Okay. We're going to find out what this error is in a moment here. Um, get string with this. What's the deal? Yeah, there's not actually an error. I think... Oh! Oh, it's because model behavior is still looking at an old new behavior script. It's because of the way that I kind of created it and I accidentally... Like, I created the script and then I sort of clicked off of it accidentally. And then I clicked back in. Model behavior was still looking for a script slash class called new behavior script or something like that. That's why it wasn't completing it. So now, now model behavior is like totally okay with this. There we go. Nice and green. And again, if I was trying to type this in, I would get all my stuff. Excellent. Okay. So we got our alert text. So, now what we're looking to do is... Uh, create the new alert, add alert to the list. Okay, so create new alert. That should tell you that, hey, we probably want to instantiate something. We want to instantiate probably something called like alert prefab, which probably means we need a public game object alert prefab like that. So we're going to instantiate that um, and add alert to the list. We need public game object alert list. So we want to be able to say something like, um, so this is going to return a game object, alert game object is equal to that. And we have to cast it to game object like that. And we want to say alert, whoops. Oh, semicolons help. Alert game object dot transform dot uh, set parent is equal to alert list. Like that. Now, one thing we can do is something like if alert list is equal to null, 
let's assume that we ourselves is the R. We are, yeah, we are the alert list object. So we just set alert list to be equal to uh, this dot game object because this wants a game object. I mean, in a sense, it should actually just maybe be the transform because I just realized set parent alert list. No, that was the wrong thing. Is this, but this is a game object. This needs a transform, so we got to say alert list dot transform. There we go. So what this alert list needs to be is alert list points to the object uh, with probably the uh, vertical layout group component, which in this case happens to be the same thing that has the alert list script on it, but there's no reason it has to be the same object, at least the way that we've implemented this, which is very handy dandy. Okay, we are going to have to go and assign the alert prefab, so let's go and do that. So our alert list, oh, we've got some lovely errors here. Right, right. Okay, so we're getting an error, and why is that? Well, we declared this new alert function to be static. And the reason we did that is because we want to be able to just call, uh, not here, in, not here. Ah, the test button right over here. We want to just be able to say alert list dot new alert, right? Conventionally, what you would see a lot in Unity is something like um, alert list al equals uh, game object dot find, um, or you could find it by name, or maybe you do something like um, find uh, where's the type? Find object of type. So we find in our hierarchy something with the type of alert list, and we stuff it in there, and then we could call al.newAlert, or, you know, all kinds of different things like that. Um, but that's kind of inconvenient. I'm a big fan of just being able to do this. One-liner, fire and forget. That's what we're looking for. The problem we're hitting here is that a static function exists on a class level. It's not associated to a specific instance, right? So we have an instance of alert list, Right? We've, imp we've got an instance of it in our hierarchy, this instance right over here, and it could, in theory, have a reference to an alert prefab or an alert to itself, but this static function doesn't know which instance of alert list we're talking about. So we have to figure that out. Now, one of the things that is quite common to do in this kind of structure is you have some sort of private or protected variable. Um, by default, if you don't specify an access level, it's, I believe it's protected, but we might want to make it private. Um, alert list, and typically you would call it instance, maybe with and without an in at lowercase, depending on if it's accessible outside. Um, but yeah, so I'm just going to call it underscore instance. So the idea, oh, and this will be static, private static alert list. And then when this alert list starts, what it's going to do, it's going to say, because this is when the alert list instance, when one of our actual game objects is actually in the world as alert list, when it starts, it's going to set the static instance to this. That way, when we're in this static function over here, we know that we can call something like instance dot alert prefab, assuming our start has run already, which, you know, we might want to check to make sure this is not null. There's all such things we could do. We could, um, another classic way to do it is to have a um, public or not, at this point, it sort of kind of doesn't matter, um, public static um, alert list. Uh, and I guess if this is an, um, a property, then we might actually have it this way um, with a getter and a setter. Well, no getter, no setter at all, but a getter, which is something like um, if instance, you know, you could check to make sure it's not null. Like if instance is equal to null, then at this point you could do something like, okay, this one time only, we're going to set instance to be equal to game object dot uh, find object of type alert list. So we find the first alert list in the active hierarchy and assign it over there. Um, and then in any case, we return instance. So then what's nice about this is you never have to explicitly set instance. The first time someone tries to do this, it looks it up. I think typically you would put the this afterwards or something like that, or maybe even in a separate list, but there you go. So this is just a private placeholder 
Um, and you tend to put these underscores here to discourage you from using it directly. Although you would normally have the, um, the case match, I think. So something like this. The underscore there is to remind you, hey, don't use this directly. So over here where we're using it directly, don't do that. Because we're no longer setting underscore instance in the start. So the first time we run this, underscore instance is going to be null. So if we tried to access it directly, that would be bad. But if we just use the uppercase version, then we're going to use this property here, which checks to see if it's null. If it is, it tries to set it. Again, we might want to check for an error or something like that. Um, and then it will just sort of return that from that way forward. So we don't have to constantly find this. With A, is slightly slow, but not really, unless you're doing it every frame, but it's inconvenient. It would suck if we constantly had to go and get a copy of the current instance of alert list and then call new alert. This avoids tons of steps, makes life so much simpler, Love it, love it, love it. Okay, so let's let's review here. If we click the button, we call new alert. If we get into new alert, we are indeed going to call create a new game object, and we're going to set in the list. So now, if we were to hit play, ooh, object reference. Oh, I had one more in here. Um, alert list. This is a instance dot alert list. There we go. Which really, I could just say instance not transform, but no. It's sort of like, you know what? I'm not going to call. I'm not going to call this alert list. I'm going to call this alert container. There we go to differentiate the fact that this alert container does not have to be the thing with alert list on it. There. So instance dot alert container dot transform is the parent of this new alert. So if we do this, that should go away. Excellent. We're going to hit play. Yeah, alert text is never used. That's right. If I hit play, this should show up. Oh, that's right. I'd never gotten around to setting these because the errors were preventing us from doing that. We need to tell it what the alert prefab is. And we have to give it a reference to the... Well, we don't have to give it an alert to the uh, a reference to the alert, co alert container because by default it will point to itself if we don't do anything about it. So if I hit this button, there we go. Now, it's important to note at this point that it's the text in our prefab. So if I go here, prefab default text. So now if I hit play and we hit test alert, we're just getting prefab default text because we never set it. But we can change that. The spacing is a little weird. I'm not sure that it correctly knows what the size of these objects are supposed to be in here. I mean, I shouldn't have to set any spacing. We didn't have to before. Are our size a little bit weird because of something else that's running? No. That seems strange to me. I no longer have that, like, weird crop. No. It's using the object 100%. I don't know why they're so squished together. We'll investigate in a, a bit there. Um, but yeah, so right now, we are not setting the text, right? It just says prefault de prefab default text. So we need to make sure. So at this point, we have the alert text, and we've created the alert game object. But we have to make sure that one's linked to the other. And that means we need a reference to unityengine.ui, because we have to access the text class, which is part of the UI package. So we can say something like, the, this game object, we want to get component in children. Although I think this technically this checks itself. We want to find the first instance of a text component in our children. And we can go and we could grab a reference to that, but we don't actually have to maintain that. We just have to say, hey, in this text component, your actual text is this alert text over here. Done. Um, to do set icon to do cache reference to game object to focus on click. We're not implementing those, but those are things that, that we could do here. All right, we've sort of prepped for some of that. So now if I hit play and I hit this, instead of the default text, we are now getting, this is a test alert. Hey, excellent. So now we can have anything in the game fire that off. So that's really, really handy. Um, I think... I think we are going to do one more episode because I think it's going to be worth um, 
actually investigating these two things. Uh, because what I want to do in the next episode is I want to have an alert happen from a normal game event, not just a button. I want to have something else in the game do some stuff and then have them to throw up an alert. That way we'll have two different ones to look at, as well as we can look into this. I mean, I can make a couple of dummy icons. Sure, let's do it. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you, all our March Patreon supporters and these mic check supporters. We've got Yukofin, Snoopy TRB, Pavel Zdanov, Drazion, Gavin Power, Jan Tori Vell, Michael McClintock, Aaron Doibson, Craig Mortel, the not so evil engineer, Julian Ogilafon, Marys Fieldvold, Speedy Savant, Steven Stager, Valiant, that's probably Stager, I don't know, Valiant Cake Fiend. Jason Yanity, Stephen Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakely, Milner, and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed. Thank you so, so much.